Hi, it's Garbo, and this is Tuesday Thing. This week's post is a prequel to next week's post. The next Tuesday Thing will have some stories and information about a screenwriter who was also a short story writer, and he wrote one of three segments of an early anthology-type film one of those collections where there are two or three or four stories told together, usually three or four shorter films, and they're put together to make one presentation. Well, sometimes when I'm doing some of the research for these posts, I come across hidden gems, or I have a happy accident and run into some cultural bit of something that's important to me. And that's what happened to me this week. The anthology film I mention in next week's post is called Flesh and Fantasy, and it came out in 1943. One of the other segments, not one that I'll include next week, but one of the others, the one that's considered actually the best of the group, and I agree, has Edward G. Robinson in it. I saw this film, the entire film, on cable a long time ago. I don't remember if it was Turner Classic Movies or, or whether it was a late night film type situation. And while I saw the whole thing, the part that I remember is the segment with Edward G. Robinson in it. Of course, that set me to looking around online to see if I could find the film or a clip of it. And I'm afraid the golden era of finding old movies for free on YouTube is over. The owners of these films are reclaiming them and putting them into their libraries. And now, you know, they want you to pay. So it was there was a magical time when you could get old movies for free on the Internet. And that time is past. So I was not able to find enough copy of Flesh and Fantasy at a price that I'd be willing to pay. However, I did realize from my Internet research that the Screen Guild Theater had done a production of some of the segments of Flesh and Fantasy, including the one that Edward G. Robinson is in. The Screen Guild Theater was an old-time radio program, and it ran on CBS radio all through the 1940s. It started in the very late 30s, like 38 or 39, and it went to just when old-time radio really faded away, which was in the early 1950s, like maybe 1952, 1951 to 1952, somewhere in there. So the golden days for Screen Guild Theater were the 1940s. It's easy to get the Screen Guild Theater a little mixed up with the Screen Actors Guild or SAG. And there is sort of an overlap in the sense that the Screen Guild Theater was its own thing, but the proceeds that would have been paid to the actors didn't go into their pockets, but instead were donated to the Motion Picture Relief Fund. And that went directly to help actors, crew members who were on hard economic times. And some of the money also went to build a facility that was part hospital, part nursing home, and part low-income housing for people who were down on their luck. Others could use the hospital facilities, and those who had money paid, but those who didn't have money could get treatment for free. While the program was on CBS, it actually had other names, a lot of times, depending on who the sponsor was. Gulf Oil was a sponsor for a while, Camel Cigarettes for a while. The sponsor for the era when this segment that you'll hear today played in 1945 was a cosmetics company called Lady Esther. I don't know or don't remember 
what the title of the edward g robinson segment of flesh and fantasy was called because i think they each had a subtitle but the screen guild theater production just calls it flesh and fantasy because they were trying to promote the movie that was in the theaters at the time so what we have here is a just under half an hour radio version and it has some of the stars from the movie but it also includes others in particular vincent price who plays one of the roles in the radio version so i hope you enjoy this and then next week there will be a new post which goes on to look at other aspects of the film flesh and fantasy the screenwriter and goes off into all kinds of other cultural connections thanks for listening Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in an episode from Flesh and Fantasy, Universal Pictures' absorbing study of destiny and the power of suggestion. It stars Vincent Price as Podgers, Edward G. Robinson as Marshall Tyler, and Dame May Whitty as Lady Pamela Hardwick. The Lady Esther Screen Guild players in Flesh and Fantasy. <laughs> In a private room in a London hospital, a man who's apparently been injured, and another man who sits beside the bed. Only silence for a moment, and then... I had to tell someone, Dr. Whitley. That's why I asked for you, though you won't believe me. I, I know you won't. Tyler, I've seen some strange things in my life. I'd suggest you tell me everything from the beginning. All right, from the beginning. I suppose you knew Lady Pamela Hardwick. If you did, you must have known the sort of person she was. Hard, brittle, with a sense of humor that was more cruel than amusing. The whole thing started at one of her parties. Rather monstrous affair. All sorts of people there. And she'd engaged a palmist to entertain her guests. His name was Podgers. Strange sort, sort of a chap. Cold, cynical. Almost, but not quite impertinent. Mrs. Carrington, you have been passing through a very dark period... But things are going to improve. You will hear from someone very dear to you. No. There's no one very dear to me anymore. Madam, it is in your hands. You will hear from your husband. Oh, that's impossible. My husband... I'm sorry. Excuse me, please. Why, Mrs. Carrington? Lady Pamela. Oh, you know Marshal Tyler, of course. <laughs> Good <laughs> heavens. What put you in such a state? That man, Mr. Podgers... He said I was going to hear from Roger. I'm afraid it was the shock. You, you'll have to excuse me, please. Marshall, isn't it thrilling? She's going to hear from Roger. Really? Well, Roger Carrington's been dead for two years, hasn't he? Almost three. You know, Lady Pamela, I think you get a kick out of upsetting your guests. Well, why not? Well, last week it was that bogus media manifesting supposed ectoplasms all over the place. The week before, voodoo. Well, my liver won't permit me to drink. I'm too old for romance. <laughs> and we English are so beastly dull. We're not like you Americans. We need whipping along. Well, uh, can't you find some better way to squander your money? <laughs> Should I give it to the poor and start a revolution? <laughs> oh, Flora. Hello, Pamela. Hello, Marshall. Flora. Hello. I've got the most wonderful palmist here. You will set him read your hand. Oh, really, Pamela? I don't But I insist. Better. Come along. Now, Pamela, please. Now, Lady Flora, you may as well relax and enjoy it. And Mr. Podgers? Here's Lady Flora. Will you read her palm? If the lady will give me her hand. <laughs> well. Uh, you play the piano. That's right. Lady Flora is passionately fond of music. Madam, I think you mean musician. <laughs> <laughs> and you, sir, why do you think I'm a fraud? Who, me? Uh, I haven't said one word yet. But you can hardly expect me to approve of all this. Everyone has a right to his own opinion, sir. But may I ask why you disapprove? Well, because if you can read the future in our palms, we human beings are only the puppets of some force from which we cannot possibly escape. Precisely. Well, you're kidding, aren't you? Not at all. May I look at your hand, sir? Oh, sure. I do not claim to be an oracle, but it is very plain that you're a lawyer. Hmm. A bang-up one. A bachelor. <laughs> and uh, head over heels in love. 
You think so? It's right here in your hand. And the lady in question will say yes. Well, you're wrong there. Definitely. I assure you, she will. You're a very lucky man. Oh, but this is wonderful. I must find Rowena. Where is she? Uh, where's that girl? Uh, well, uh, Mr. Podgers, uh, any more misinformation? Well, let me see. Your hand indicates that... Well? Nothing. I I see nothing at all. Yes, but you do. I, I can see by your face. Oh, please, Mr. Podgers. I, uh, well, the gentleman will go on a trip somewhere. Probably on his honeymoon. <laughs> yes, yes, that's it. On his honeymoon. Uh, I, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> There you are, Rowena. I've been looking for you, my dear. Have you? Why, have you been hiding out here at the conservatory? What's the matter with you? I've just been talking it out with Gerald. I should have broken with him months ago. But it's ended now, for good and all. You're through with Gerald? And you're going to marry Marshal Tyler. How did you know? Never mind. Come along. Marshal. Marshal Tyler. Uh, calling me? I believe Rowena has something to tell you. Something very personal. I'll busy myself with the work. Rowena, you, you want to say something to me? What? What is it? The way you look. Uh, is anything wrong? Can I get you a drink? No. But you can marry me if you like. Oh. Just to make a silly prediction come true. I mean it, Marshal. Now, Rowena, don't joke. I, I've waited so long. Too long? Don't you want me now? You know I do. I give my life. But it seems so strange. That ridiculous Ladies chap, and how could he? We bring you a special last-minute bulletin. But that sounds important, Pamela. Turn it up. Sir Roger Carrington, well-known explorer, given up for lost over two years ago, has been found at last. Sir Roger. Sir Roger and his party are all alive and well. Hodges was right. He was right after all. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Podgers, my uh, coming here to your place tonight was no casual whim. Last night you saw something in my hand. I demand to know what it is, and I'm prepared to pay you a uh, hundred pounds. You aren't, really. You doubt my word? Oh, no. Not your word. On my ability to pay? No, you're very rich, of course. Well, then, let's not waste any time. Here, look at my hand. Well? What a contradiction of moods you are. All mixed up in intricate like a little Swiss watch. I'm not here to inquire into my character. Character is the label of the man, Mr. Tyler, and he wears it in his palm. Yes, it's all here. <laughs> the perfect lawyer. Vain, egocentric, no real conviction. You'd have made an excellent criminal lawyer. I'm not interested in crime. But you will be. About 15 years ago... I want the future, Mr. Podgers, not the past. There are some things it's better not to know. Well, regardless of what it is, I demand that you tell me. Even if you're very brave... Well, speak up. What's in my hand? Murder. Murder? You're going to kill someone, Mr. Tyler. That will be 100 pounds, please. <laughs> yes. Yes, I... That's funny, my, my wallet. I'm sure I had it in my... You will find your wallet at home, on your bureau. Yes. Uh, I, I'll send you a check. Oh, and on your way home, it might be wise to avoid Whitechapel Street. Good night. No, it's absurd, ridiculous. What can he possibly know about me? Oh, the man's a fool, an imposter, a downright... Yes, sir? Did you say something, Mr. Hmm? Tyler? Oh, oh, no, no, Paul. I, I, I'm just thinking aloud. Yes, sir. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm driving... Stop! 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 You all right, sir? He didn't hit you, did he? No. No. Oh, where are we, Paul? Whitechapel Street, sir. Whitechapel? Nasty spot, sir. Shall we be getting on? No, no, uh... Uh, you you take the car, Paul. I I think I need a little walk. Walk, Mr. Tyler. Walk, Mr. Tyler. You can't get away. It's in your hand. 
You're going to kill someone, Mr. Tyler. Why? Why should I? Why do I have to? Uh, that, uh, are you talking to me? Huh? Oh, no, no. I, I wasn't. I, well, I was just... Funny. Uh... There ain't nobody else about. Now, don't you go talking to yourself like that, chum. Folks, uh, folks like to think you're Barney. <laughs> Barney? Maybe I am. Maybe I am going out of my mind. Together. Yes, I must. Now, how could Podgers really know? But he knew about Rowena, didn't he? Shot in the dark. And Sir Roger Carrington. Coincidence. And my wallet. Well, you're always forgetting your wallet. And, and Whitechapel Street. Oh, forget it, will you? Put it out of your mind. Yes, yes. Yes, I will. That's what I'll do. I'll put the whole thing out of my mind. <laughs> Monday. It's been two days and nothing's happened yet. You're going to kill someone, Mr. Tyler. Wednesday. Wednesday. Four days. You're going to kill someone, Mr. Tyler. Saturday. It's a week, but perhaps... You're going to kill someone, Mr. Oh, Tyler. Oh, stop it! Stop it! It's no use. I can't sleep. I, I can't work. I can't think. Do something about it, old man. What you mean? Murder someone deliberately? Well, I suppose you could uh, just press a little button and kill some worthless old beggar 10,000 miles away. Would you do it to be free again? Yes, yes, I. Yes, I think I would. Ha <laughs> I see. Murder is simply a matter of miles. Yes, but someone like that, old and worthless. Well, aren't there people like that right here? Old and worthless? Absolutely worthless. Who? Oh, any number of them. Nancy Grant, Sandra Worthington, Pamela Hardwick. Oh, no, 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 not Lady Pam. Well, why not? Would, would, would you miss her? No. No, I wouldn't. Well, would anyone miss her? No, I... I can't think of anyone. <laughs> not a soul. In fact, a lot of people would be delighted. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, she is a selfish old wretch. Holy sick. You'd really be doing her a good turn. Besides, uh, yeah, she's pretty old. Seventy? Oh, uh, seventy-five at least. Well, what she got left? A uh, few years at best. A few weeks? Well, uh, a few months. She's ideal. Well, still, she's, she's always been, been very fond of me. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, it's Lady Pamela, all right. Now, all I've got to decide is... How? The second act of the Lady Esther Scream Girl play will follow in just a moment. Now, a word from Lady Esther. Have you the courage to look ten years younger? Have you the courage to look lovelier and more romantic? Women say my new shade of face powder, Bridal Pink, does just that. They say they can actually see the years slip away when they apply Bridal Pink. They can see the faded yellow look vanish from their skin. See it take on a quality of beauty and radiance that's like a magnet attracting all eyes. Bridal Pink is a new kind of shade, based on an entirely different principle in color blending. It's not for just one particular skin coloring, but for four basic skin types. Bridal Pink is equally flattering, whether your hair is blonde, brown, auburn, or black. You see, Lady Esther face powder isn't just mixed in the usual way. It's highly pulverized by the tremendous force of hurricanes. Pulverized so fine, it feels light as a feather on your skin. Yet it completely covers tiny lines and blemishes. And though it's light and cool as a summer breeze, it clings four hours and longer. It even makes your features look smaller and daintier. If your druggist is sold out of brighter pink, ask him to order it for you. But accept no other shade. For remember, only Lady Esther Bridal Pink Face Powder can give you the look of a woman in love. 
that happy, radiant look, that look of complete self-confidence. And now, Lady Esther presents the second act of Flesh and Fantasy, starring Dame May Whitty, Vincent Price, and Edward G. Robinson. The hospital room again. The same two men... And after another long moment of silence... So, you decided to kill her, Tyler. Now, Whitley, what's the matter with you? Haven't you been listening? I didn't decide. The whole thing was decided for me. How did you go about it? And I got hold of some poison. Saconatine. And then I bought a box of chocolates. A very lovely box. A cloisonne, 17th century, I think. And you poisoned the chocolate? Yes, sir. Just one of them. Wrapped in silver foil. And then... And then I took it to Lady Pan. Marshall, how sweet of you. What a charming little box. And how's Rowena? Oh, she's... Uh... Is the wedding day set? Well, not quite. I think She'll that... make a wonderful wife. Not the least bit in love with you. So she can't fall out of love. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think of my little Mr. Podgers now? Wasn't he superb, the way he told Flora about her musicians? Oh, yes, magnificent. They tell me that at a rehearsal of the symphony the other afternoon, a messenger from Flora arrived saying, same time, same place. And all 60 men stood up and said thank you. <laughs> well, uh, tell me, did uh, Mr. Podgers have any special revelation for you? Silly. I only find other people's secret interesting. Well, that little box has a secret for you. Oh, tell me. Well, it's a new cure for that liver of yours. Not really. Why, they, they look like chocolate. Well, they're put up by an American. I'm told they work wonders. Oh, how amazing. I must take one at once. Oh, oh no, no, no. Please, please. If you take one without having an attack, it might be the end of you. Very well. I'll wait until my next attack. <laughs> really, Marshal, you're very thoughtful. Rowena's done you a great deal of good. Yes, worlds of good. As a matter of fact, I'm on my way to see her. Mm -hmm. To plan the wedding, no doubt. No, to postpone it. I, I must go to Paris. Oh, but that's too bad. For long? Well, frankly, I don't know. It all depends. It all depends. <laughs> Rowena, what are you doing here? What brought you to Paris? I had to come. I had to see you. Marshal, why have you run away from me? Yeah, but I haven't. You said you'd be gone only a few days, and here it's going on to three weeks. I thought you... Now, Rowena, please, I can explain. You... Oh, excuse me. Uh, hello? Yes? What? When? Uh, yes, 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 of course. Uh, yes, Monday at three. Goodbye. Who was it, Marshal? Uh, my office. What is it? You seem so elated. Elated? <laughs> well, naturally, that call meant that we can go back to London. And? And we can get, we can be married. When? Uh, right away, Monday. Uh, no, the uh, day after that. All day Monday, I'll be busy. Another client. Which one this time? Uh, Lady Pamela Hardy. I think you know her. Well, of course I know. She's my godmother. Oh, yes, that's right, of course. Marshal, what does she need you for? Well, uh, she doesn't need me, my dear. She died this morning. I'm glad you got back in time, Tyler. I know Pamela would have wanted you here when I read the service. Well, I wouldn't have let anything interfere, Your Grace. Uh, did she suffer much toward the end? Not at all. It was very peaceful. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Very glad. Uh, by the way, I've had a notification from your office. Uh, it's uh, true about the will? Yes, sir. Uh, quite true, Your Grace. Her entire estate goes to the church. You'll be chief executor. She was a good woman, Tyler. In some respects, a very great woman. Well, I think most of us are here and have to look to it. If you'll excuse me now. She didn't suffer. She didn't suffer at all. Marshal, look at this enchanting little box. Uh, where did you find that? On the coffee table there. First and age. Must be several hundred years old. Oh, <laughs> wouldn't you know that Pam would fill it with chocolate? Good one, too, I'll wait. Rowena. Only one, Marshal. I figure I can stand it. 
This one, I think, in the silver bowl. You don't eat that, you hear? Give it to me. But the, the best place for these is on the fire. My darling, anyone would think they were poison. Uh, Rowena, you, you you must forgive me. I I beg your I... pardon. They're about to start the service in the drawing room. Thank you. Coming, Marshal? Uh, yes, you you go along. I'll, I'll be right in. Poor oh, dear, you're so upset by all this. I understand. You were so close to Pamela. I know you want to be alone. I'll wait inside. She never ate that chocolate. She never ate it. No, she must have died quite naturally. Natural death. That's too bad. Now you'll have to pick someone else. Well, I, I can't. There's, there's no time. I'm getting married tomorrow. Well, there must be someone else. Perhaps he's here. Yes, Just look around. We gathered in this familiar place. We meet in the memory of one still with us. For she is not dead. She has not gone. She has merely attained that spiritual serenity, that true state of peace for which we all yearn. Did you hear that? And no human being could desire a happier release... Listen. ...than this swift and painless passage into the kingdom of heaven. That's it. Oh, death, thou great liberator, where is thy sting indeed? Death, the great liberator. Don't you understand? He wants to die. <laughs> See, Your Grace, I thought that if I came to you, told you the whole story, you might be able to give me the answer. It's uh, possible. With that constant threat hanging over him, ruining his life, his career, everything he holds dear, is he to blame for taking his fate into his own hands? Uh, this man, uh, a client of yours, you say? Yes. In my opinion, he must be quite mad. Oh, no, no, no. Believe me, he's sane. As sane as you are. A victim of hallucination. Oh, no, no, no. No, no such thing. <laughs> Surely... If it had been intended that we poor mortals should know what will befall us on the morrow, God would have provided some natural and simple way of our finding out. Cigarette. Thanks. He's off his guard now. Watch your chance. I cannot believe he would have entrusted such important matters to characters like this, Mr. Podger, as you tell me about. There's a knife there on the desk. It would be so easy. Believe me, Mr. Tyler, the fault lies with ourselves. The sin lies in trying to pry into what is no mortal affair. A knife. Pick it up. But Matthew says it's better now. than... Now. Put down that knife, my son. Lest you harm yourself. Uh, your, your grace, I, I... Forgive me, I'm sorry. I've got to get out of here. going to kill someone, Mr. Tyler. You're going to kill someone. Mr. Tyler. Hmm? Oh, uh, uh, hello, officer. Bad night to be walking on the bridge, Mr. Tyler. Worst fog we there. Yes, yes. <laughs> A fine night for murder. You better watch it, sir. How long? How long must I walk? How long must I wait? How long must oh, I... Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Oh, uh, my fault. Oh, not at all. I should have... Why, it's Mr. Tyler. Hodges. How are you, sir? How am I? How could anyone be after what you told me? Well, you asked for the truth. I, I didn't put it in your hand. No, but you put it in my mind. You wanted to know. You insisted. Well, look again. Perhaps you made a mistake. Mr. Tyler, you'd better go home. Get some sleep. Perhaps you made a mistake. Perhaps I did. Now, come around and see me tomorrow. No, now, now. Well, Here, I, look at my hand. I, well... Well, my word, how extraordinary. Yes. I believe I owe you an apology. Apology? Yes, it, it doesn't seem to be there. Yes, it is, it is. No, no, I, I swear. Liar! I tell you it isn't. I... Stop! Let go! I'm my going throat. to kill someone. Let go! I'm what? going to kill someone. What is it there? Now, what's going on? Come now, you can't be disturbing. Why, Mr. Tyler. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, I'll have to take you along. No, no, you won't. I won't let you take me in. Stop! Stop, I say! Look out there! I... I didn't see the lorry until it was right on top of me. And then everything went black. When I came to, I was here in the hospital... 
where you've been ever since. But I can't send me to the gallows. It, it wasn't my fault. I tell you, the whole thing was in my hand. Ordained, foredestined since the beginning of time. Sorry. Yes? Dr. Whitley speaking. Oh, yes, he's quite out of danger. Yes, of course, I'll tell him. He'll be glad to know. Who's that? Lady Pamela Hardwick. Lady Pam? Yes, she just got back. Got back? From Scotland. She's been there for over a month. And how... How could she? I, I don't understand. Tyler, you've been a very sick man. Rather nasty accident you had. By the way, if you're able to use your hand again, you can thank Dr. Podgers for it. Dr. Podgers? Our chief surgeon. Well, then... Then it was all imagination. From the opium. Most of it. But uh, not all. I'll let you in on a little secret. Uh, Rowena broke her engagement yesterday. What you mean? She's free? Free, white, and willing. So if you want to disobey my orders and use the telephone... You know, Dr. Whitley, one of these days, I think I'm going to shake your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vincent Price, Edward G. Robinson, and Dame May Whitty for a most thrilling half hour. Well, surely, Mr. Bradley, you must know that we all consider it a privilege to appear with the Lady Esther Screen Guild players. The Motion Picture Relief Fund and its country house are both largely supported by this radio program, and we are more than proud to share in that wonderful work. <laughs> Next week, the Lady Esther Screen Girl players will present Smiling Through. It will star Lorraine Day, Sir Aubrey Smith, and Van Heflin. Be sure to listen. Edward G. Robinson is starred in the forthcoming Metro Golden Mare picture, Our Vines Have Tender Grapes. Dame May Whitty will soon be starred in the Broadway play, Therese Requin, directed by her daughter, Margaret Webster. Vincent Price can soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox picture, Dragon Wick. Flesh and Fantasy was presented through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, producers of Uncle Harry. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>